from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, good evening everyone. I can't believe it's evening already. I hope that you guys have had a great day. My name is Gail Osterberg. I'm the Director of Communications at the Library of Congress. My team is responsible for helping to get the word out about all of the programs and events like this one at the library. And so I can't let this opportunity um, pass uh, without asking that each of you, if you had a great time today, to please look at our website, loc.gov, follow us on social media, and learn more about all of the great free events at your national library that occur throughout the year. We would love to have you um, at other things. Um, we hope that these events are impactful, that they are educational and entertaining, that they instill a love of reading and um, inspire your curiosity. Speaking of having an impact, please raise your hand if you have ever read a little golden book. I would be very surprised if it wasn't pretty much every single hand. These books are synonymous with childhood and childhood lessons. Billions of these books have been sold since they were introduced in 1942. Our author this evening, our grand finale here on the picture book stage, is like all of us. She grew up reading little golden books. What sets her apart, however, is that she once told her mom, according to an interview that I read, that when she grew up, she was going to make books like these. And that is exactly what Diane Muldrow did. She is the editorial director at Golden Books Random House and the editor of the famous Little Golden Books. She's also a prolific author of books for kids of all ages, including the middle grade series Dish, the picture book We Planted a Tree, and I would argue a prolific author for adults with her series, Everything I Need to Know, I Learned from a Little Golden Book. Most recently, Everything I Need to Know, I Learned from a Disney Little Golden Book. My memories of the little golden books, as I'm sure many of yours are, involve reading them aloud, either with your parents or maybe now with your children. I read Diane's new book um, aloud to my girlfriends last weekend, and we were so engrossed with nostalgia and reminiscing and sharing our stories that I burned the wings on my barbecue, um, which was a shame. <laughs> I am really looking forward to hearing what she has to share with us this evening, as I'm sure you all are. So it is my great pleasure to welcome to the National Book Festival stage, Diane Muldrow. Thank you so much. That was such a nice introduction. I am really honored to be here today uh, among so many gifted writers and wonderful book fans. And uh, I guess that's how I, I got started and how these books happened. I, I grew up reading little golden books. My mother uh, was a very uh, overachieving housewife and was wallpapering and cooking from scratch and uh, doing the gardening and the landscaping. And so, um, you know, I look at mothers today and they really play with their kids. I mean, I, I'm still from the generation where our parents didn't really maybe play with us in the way that parents do today. So I was very smart. I would, um, um, my mom says that all I really needed to be happy was um, to be read to. And I think partly that came from just wanting to be near her and to be close to her and, ha you know, maybe she would sit down <laughs> for a minute. So um, we had a little basket near the fireplace full of books, most of which were golden books and most of which we got at the supermarket. And uh, that was my way of spending time with my wonderful, beautiful mother who would uh, who, was, who I still, when I read the little golden books, I can still hear her voice reading them out loud. And that was a nice connection that we have. And it's been really fun for her to see me grow up and, and be the editor of Little Golden Books. Uh, so that's sort of a, a little bit of, of the beginning. I started my career at Golden Books out of college in 1987. And um, it was, you know, I hadn't really thought about childhood books in a very long time. I didn't major in literature, I was a journalism major, and I also got at the same time a fine arts degree in modern dance. So I didn't take that lit path, and um, I had sent my resume, but I knew I wanted to work in children's publishing. At the end of my college career, 
uh, I was thinking, well, what am I going to do? I have these two degrees. What, what should I do? And the answer came when I walked into the college bookstore in Athens, Ohio, and realized you know, that I was turning into the children's section, and ha as I had always done. And finally, a light bulb went off, and I thought, oh, you know, this is where I always go in a bookstore first. Maybe I should work in, in children's books. So that's what happened. I had always read, and I had always written, actually. I had written, I actually have curvature of the spine from um, sitting and writing left-handed over my desk. And uh, so, uh, so that's uh, sort of the beginning of it. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Little Golden Books have been around since 1942. They came out in the height of World War II, which was America's, the height, I mean, they came out in 1942, which was the height of America's involvement in World War II. And they quickly reprinted in the tens of thousands. They launched with 12 titles, one you may have heard of. It's the only one from that 12 original list of 12 titles called The Pokey Little Puppy. And it is the best-selling picture book of all time. So uh, Little Golden Books launched in October of 1942, and within six months they had reprinted in the 10s and 20s and 30s thousands. And by the 50s they were all over the world in many languages, including Tagalog. Um, they were pretty much everywhere except the Soviet Union where Pokey, Little Puppy, was considered a capitalistic symbol. So he was, he was not allowed behind the Iron Curtain. Um, so Little Golden Books have been providing comfort to people since 1942. They were designed to be inexpensive, and they, I really feel that they democratized reading in America at a time when children did not own books as they do today. You know, kids have so much stuff today, but um, before World War II, little golden, uh, children's books were considered luxury items. They could cost upward of two to three dollars, and they weren't something that every family just had lying around. So, um, you know, during the war when money was tight and things were difficult for people, they were still able to cobble together a quarter and that's what a little golden book cost in those days. And they could, you know, people were buying these books, you know, literally by the tens and soon hundreds of thousands. So that's, I think, just a very important thing to consider that at a time when money was tight and morale was low, you know, you had Eleanor Roosevelt on her weekly radio address encouraging people to keep their family routine and maybe the little golden books helped with that. And maybe children were finally getting to read books more often and were becoming better readers or better readers earlier. Another thing that I think um, is important to consider is that, you know, in any kind of revolution that you have, a revolution never happens out of nowhere. It may seem combustible, but really any kind of revolution you can think of had a million little trails leading up to it. And I think little golden books were revolutionary, but there were lots of things that were leading up to that, and one of which was the paperback book for adults. So paperback books had come out from Simon & Schuster, and they were everywhere people were. They were in train stations and in places where people really shopped every day. That was the same, the same group of people that put the pocketbooks out did the little golden books. So they already had that track record. One important thing that they did, it's a little thing that's a big thing, is they put that little nameplate, and you all know it, this little golden book belongs to. I think that's very touching because children were able to write their name in a book and own it. And if you had a book that was $3 and kept on a high shelf, maybe you weren't supposed to write in it, you know? But you could do that in a Little Golden Book. So I've worked at Little Golden Books for uh, twice in my career for over 20 years. And uh, I've written many children's books, including many Little Golden Books. One day I was on the subway. It must have been about, mm, I would say, six years ago. 
And I was just sitting there, as I usually do in the morning. I don't tend to read much or anything and um, in the morning. And suddenly, everything I need to know I learned from a little golden book popped into my head. It just popped into my head, just like that. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be fun to write a book aimed at adults, like a life guide, because we all grew up with them, and they all gave us important little lessons. But it was, um, remember that fiscal crisis we had in 2008? Well, it was, it was not long after that had happened. And I'm sure you remember in our culture, there was a lot of soul searching going on. Uh, had we saved enough for retirement? Had, you know, are we going out to dinner too much? I mean, at least in New York, you know, this was stuff that everyone was talking about and uh, where I live. And so I started looking back to the little lessons of the little golden books and they came from a much simpler time and they've always provided, you know, when they came out in World War II, they provided comfort to a lot of people. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could write a book aimed at adults, but using the little golden book artwork and characters and their little sub-stories, um, and do it as a, like a comfort book for adults. So that's what I did. I did it for my own entertainment. I started writing it that very day on the subway. I started, um, I love the artwork so much in these books. And the artwork in the little golden books, especially between the 40s and the 50s and a little bit in the 60s, was done by some of the finest illustrators of the 20th century. So people always remark on how beautiful the art is, and that's because these were really talented people who were doing great things. They were illustrating New Yorker covers. Uh, they were doing all that kind of illustration and had, had fine art backgrounds. So the artwork, has really endured. Um, everyone loves, you know, here's the happy man in his dump truck by Tibor Gergely, who emigrated from Hungary to the United States. These, these pictures resonate so much for people. So just for fun, I started writing a guide to life. And uh, I wasn't sure if it was very good. And every now and then, you know, I'd think of a picture that I really loved um, one of my favorite pictures, I'm sure you know, the Saggy Baggy Elephant. And every time I see this picture of Saggy, I hope you can all see that, he's joyously squirting water just for the fun of it. Um, that picture makes me laugh or smile every time I see it, and I've been working on these books for over 20 years. And um, so, I had to have, I knew I had to have that in this book. And I wrote, the simplest things are often the most fun. Because I really wanted this book to illustrate the simplest things in life and how we, we already have them in our lives. So for about three years, just whenever I thought of it, a great line, a funny line or a great line, I would write it down and I would go to the color copier and I would Xerox the book, the picture from a book, and I would tape it down on a dummy. And I did it just whenever I thought of a line, because really I was just doing this for my own entertainment. And I would, then I would shove it under my desk. And um, the pile got bigger under my desk and dustier. And I would just keep, like I said, just whenever I felt like it for th over three years. Well, then we had an office move. And I'm sure you know how traumatic office moves can be. So. <laughs> Um, I was very caught up in the office move, and one day I finally got to the part of my office where this big stack of dusty papers was. And um, I thought, you know, maybe it's time to take this thing home and see if it's any good or not. So I folded it up and I put it in a, a tote bag, probably one like you're all carrying today from the book fest, and I took it home for the weekend, and I was shocked to see that I had 75 pages, and that most of it seemed pretty good. So I brought it into my boss, who conveniently was at the time the publisher of Random House Children's Books, and I said, you know, I have this kooky thing. I don't really know if it's any good. I think it's kind of funny, but I don't know if people will get it, and um, handed it to her. And a few days later, she appeared at my door and said, this is going to be a bestseller. Can you write more? And I said, sure, I'll write more. So I wrote, you know, like 50 more pages, 
and I wrote more than I needed so we could weed out the weak pages. And um, with her help, it, it really got much better. I would, I think I, she was the one that actually told me, um, you just want one line on a page. I had sometimes little descriptions of the characters and the stories and why we should revere them. And she thought, no, just one line on a page. So she simplified it, fied it and it really made it better. And it did go on to become a New York Times bestseller. And I still thought, well, you know, that's great. It's a New York Times bestseller. And we had a new regime come in and uh, they saw the success and they said, you know, we want you to write more books. And I thought, well, how could I write more when it's called everything I need to know? I mean, it's all in here. So um, I think it was our, our president who said, you know, tell her she's got to write a Christmas one. <laughs> so I thought, oh, Christmas, okay. So we have a lot of great Christmas art in the vintage Little Golden books, but not really enough. Here's one of my favorite. I call this the money shot. This is by Eloise Wilkin, one of our most beloved illustrators in the Little Golden Books. And, uh, you know, I decided, well, what, what's the hook? So I thought, let's list everything that adults don't like about Christmas in the beginning of the book. So I have, Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year and all, but there's so much to do. All that baking, the endless cycle of cooking and cleaning, blah, blah, blah. And that kind of sets the stage for then all the wonderful things that happen at Christmas. Elves are standing by. And suddenly, you know, start planning the menu. So uh, suddenly it got me in the Christmas spirit and, um, and so that was fun to do. And then I thought I was finished. And they said, no, we want more. So once again, I was at a loss as to what I would do next. And then within five minutes of a, a, a hallway trip to uh, the ladies' room, two colleagues literally said within five minutes, you should write a book about love. So out came love. And I actually fell in love while I was writing this book, which was, um, I think it did a lot to make a much better book <laughs> than it might have been. So um, I fell in love at age 50 and uh, so this is a little bit of a testament to that. And I dedicated it to my boyfriend, who actually was my boyfriend 30 years ago, too. And uh, my editor said, you know, you're dedicating it to, to Lou, but you and Lou really haven't been back together that long, and you haven't been together in 30 years. And um, someone walked by and said, um, it's really just a black plate change in the reprint edition if they break up. So, um, so every now and then I'll remind my boyfriend that he's really just a black plate change away from, from, from something. So, uh, so now the Disney one is out and that was a really fun one to write because every time I embark on one of these new ones, I have to say, well, what is the hook? And I thought, obviously with Disney, it was magic. And magic is something that we feel around us as children. And when we grow up, we tend to, with our responsibilities and our disappointments, we tend to forget that. And the Disney one, um, I think if you're looking for an inspirational book, this really is it. There's just something about all those wonderful movies and characters and the strength that they have to show and the things they go through and the friendships that they have that really reminds us um, about you know, the, the, the gist of the book is magic is something we can make ourselves. The good news is we don't need a fairy godmother to do that. And so this book, I think, um, I was very proud of it when I was finished because I think it really helps remind us grown-ups how we, magic really is around us in our friendships and in our relationships and in nature and um, in our own inner strength and in the hope that we always have to have carried around with us. So that's just sort of the gist of um, what I'm doing with these books. There's another one coming out in spring of 17, Everything I Need to Know About Family. And I can't tell you what will happen after that, but it's just been a wonderful thing to be able to be the editor, editor and caretaker of this line and then be able to write these fun books that remind adults how much they loved those books. So it's, an, it's a valentine to Little Golden Books, 
but it's also Valentine to all of you who grew up with them and love them so much. So I'm happy to take questions if you like, if anybody has any questions. Anybody out there? I'm gonna come down now, just because I can't, it's hard to keep. I was born in 1963, and yeah, Cinderella was the book uh, or the movie that uh, I really loved. Also, The Jungle Book was the first movie I ever saw, and so yes, good one too. Not so much. I will tell you that the Disney artists, um, you know, these were some of the again some of the finest illustrators and animators of their time. And uh, I've actually done a whole talk on that. Um, and there's Tengren, actually, who did the Pokey Little Puppy, um, was an animator at Disney. Or he didn't animate, he did concept paintings that the animators then animated. So before animation, um, the painter, painters, artists paint scenes that create the mood and the palette of the film and of the characters, literally down to what they're wearing, the colors that they're wearing. Peter Pan, think of all the green in that movie. Mary Blair was the, the concept artist who did that. Mary Blair then went on to illustrate I Can Fly, which was a great golden book. So there's a very interesting tie between the Disney artists and little golden books. And there's a great book out by Charles Solomon. Um, if you wanna read more about that, I got to give a talk with him about that. And I'm blanking out on the book, but I think it's called The Art of Disney Little Golden Books. You have a question? Yes. You know, the, the print runs were so high on even the, the early Little Golden Books um, that they're, they're maybe not as valuable as people might think. They're also, you know, when you, when you find old Little Golden Books, wherever you find them, antique stores or tag sales or your attic, they've pretty much been loved to shreds, right? I mean, that was sort of the idea. A go little golden books were very, they were designed to be sturdy and they held up, you know, um, but there are, there are some that are very valuable if you can find them. Those tend to be the ones that had the paper dolls in them or things with movable parts, the little golden activity books, but those are hard to find altogether because the kids always, cut out the paper dolls or, or you know whatever it was yes mhm mm Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, that's wonderful. If you couldn't hear her, this is a lady who grew up in Indonesia who had English language copies and learned, to, learned English from them. Um, I will tell you that uh, I, every year I do reissue the older books. So if there are some that you've been waiting for to come out, be patient because they, they might be coming out soon. Um, we, the nice thing, uh, at least for me and my purposes, is that we hold a lot of the art in our archive so we can do really nice digital scans. And the, it, the reissues I'm doing of the older books often look better than the first editions of the originals, simply because the technology has improved so much um, the colors are better. So, um, and then every year I also put out new little golden books 
that I hope will be the classics of tomorrow. So I don't think I will consider my job a success until I'm, you know, 85. And by then, um, we'll see how many of the books that I put out, if they're still in print, I'll think that I did a good job. The Golden Guides, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'm glad they, they found you all the way in Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Hi, thanks for your oh. presentation. Um, yes. I made sure I gave that book to my nephew at the beginning of his senior year this year because I knew it would be a hot. Uh, graduation present, so it was a, anyhow, um, I'm interested in the covers, uh -huh. and um, I, don't, I've, I haven't seen them all, but I thought that maybe they're all women, and I would just yeah, be they're all women. just be interested to hear that, and um. then also just, um, I'd just be interested to hear more about language, and if they're still being yeah. adapted into other languages, mm -hmm. particularly yeah. maybe some, maybe not some of the major languages, so those yeah. are my two questions. Um, you know, as I said, they used to be all over the world and, and in many languages. Little Golden Books now are not in as many languages as there used to be, but they are very big in uh, the Netherlands. We license them into Greece, uh, into Finland, um, and, and to Japan. So they are still out there around the world sometimes in, as English copies or translated. Uh, oh, sorry, one more thing. I know you asked about the women on the cover. Um, I, you know, I kind of, I really do write these for baby boomers, and we thought it'd be good to have a woman on the cover just because we thought that would really be the, the real consumer of these books, because women buy them for their kids, they buy them for the men in their lives. Um, the, the, the women are all stock photos from the 50s, and they were all black and white, and we colorized them. And they look, they don't look like they were ever black and white photos, but they were. <laughs> so, yeah. Hi. Hi. Well, my question is very similar to what she just asked. I was curious to know where the, um, the inspiration of the, the photos came from uh -huh. the covers, if it was, you know, during that time period. Or you just mentioned that, you know, your mother would read you little yeah. Ona books. So I thought, was it an inspiration from your mom? Um, I think we wanted a woman. Um, I'll, from the past, uh, I can't. If you could go up and get me one, I would show them. Um, but most people, I mean, the the artwork that I'm showing in these books is mostly what I consider the golden age of illustration for children's books in America, which was the 40s and 50s. I think we're in a new golden age. And if you, you know, you've seen the picture books here this this weekend and hear and heard the illustrators talking, a lot of them were grew up with little golden books. Um, and I think we're in a really exciting time right now. But I think that golden age was the 40s and the 50s. Right, so um, this one, we, we found this woman, she wasn't wearing a, a mount, the mouse ears originally, but we thought she looked a lot like Annette Funicello. And her expression is so perfect for the title <laughs> that, um, you know, we just, I said, well, we have to add Tinkle Bell, and then once we added Tinker Bell, I said, could we have some glitter on the cover, which we hadn't done on the others. So um, the covers are a big, uh, a big uh, topic of discussion, and um, this one was perfect, too. We just keep somehow, I have a wonderful art director who designs them, and she keeps finding these amazing images, and then we pay a stock house for those. I was wondering, um, are any of the original artists still alive? And if so, have they given any feedback or, yeah. or opinions? Of Unfortunately, the, the great artists that I feature in these books have all passed on as early as the 60s. But I'm in touch with their heirs, most of which are their children. Their children are um, around my age or even older. Um, and they're... The children are mostly wonderful caretakers of their parents' legacies and are really thrilled with these books because they feel that it brings more attention to their parents' work, even though their parents' work is still in print. Um, every now and then you might realize that some of the books I'm showing, some of the artwork in here is from books that are out of print. I always like to put a few pieces of out of print 
art in the book, in these, because I think it, it you know, I can't, not everything can always be in print. Sometimes books are just too dated or uh, maybe they're, they just haven't held up um, for today's kids, but the art is still wonderful, so I, I love to put those in. Uh, so yeah, I would say that the heirs are very, very excited by, by these books. Um, my question, first of all, I love the Golden Book, so thank you very much, and thank you. How many new ones, I actually have two questions. Yeah. How many new ones come out each year? Um, I probably put out maybe six to eight mm -hmm. to ten. Okay. And that's, that's not including all the licensed ones. So, you know, we also do new Disney books and new mm -hmm. SpongeBob, and, you know, the whole arm of this that's licensed stuff. And the licensed uh, books have always been a huge part of of uh, Little Golden Books. You might remember the Western, the, all the Western TV shows and all the Hanna-Barbera cartoons those were also in Little Golden Books. I don't work on the licensed titles, but with, if you include those, we just do dozens and dozens of new ones okay. each year. And then my other question is, years ago, I'm a, a public librarian, years ago we got a huge box, and I, all, I can't exactly say where we got it from, but it was a huge box of Golden Books that were blank and the mm -hmm. cover was blank. Was, is that something that would ever happen again? Um, well, those were so books that we popular. put, um, yeah, we put, used to put those in box sets. Okay. So that we would fill out the box set with one blank book. Um, and kids loved those because they could write their own little golden book. And we don't do that anymore. Um, we, I choose to put another real book in the box set. But so. It was so I'm so glad you like those. Oh, that's terrific. That's good. Well, it's good to hear that in case we, we might bring it back. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, question is, I wondered how many Little Golden Book authors have there been? Because I assume there's been multiple. Uh -huh. um, second question is, are you currently looking for new authors to submit? And my third question is, do you ever say LGB? We say LGB all the time. I would think so. Yeah. I, in fact, I have to catch myself and not say LGB. Um, in a, in a situation like this, because it's such an office term, you know. Um, uh, I can't tell you how many authors there have been over the years. There have been over 1,400 titles since the 40s. So, uh, of course, a lot of them were written by the same author, you know. Um, even today, I use a stable of authors. I, I tend to use the same authors over and over. I often will call an author with an idea, and I'll say, I want you to write a book about... Um, you know, I w how many of you know that wonderful book, I Stink, by Kate? I loved that book. And when it came out, I thought, I love this book. You know, like, and I, I love that it was written from the truck's point of view. So I hired my colleague, Dennis, who's a really terrific writer and a really creative person. And I said, I want you to create a truck, a, tuck, a truck character and write a story about from his point of view. So I, you know, I riffed off that idea. And we have a book now called I'm a Truck. And it started a whole sub-series, I'm a, you know, well, we have I'm a T-Rex and some other fun books. Um, am I looking for, manu I'm always looking for new writers and manuscripts. Um, I think very few people write Little Golden Books well. There seems to be a very, it's a very specific way of writing or a very specific type of content. And, um, I've even turned down really well-known authors' little golden book manuscripts because they just didn't have that little golden book feel. Um, but I am always looking for, for new writers and stories. Is that it? Okay. Thank you so much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.